So, um, yeah, I guess uh, by, by way of introduction, w welcome everybody to the talk tonight. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to have Nadir Khan speaking. He's a photographer that I've been aware of for a number of years. And if you've ever seen any really beautiful uh, adventure photography, particularly based in Scotland, it's it's uh, likely to be uh, Nadir, who's, who's been uh, taking the photos. He's photographed a number of people who've actually spoken for us at previous talks, um, including Ian Innes, uh, Nicky Innes's son, um, and, a, and a bunch of other people as well. Um, so a, just the format for tonight, um, I'll hand over to Nadir in just a minute. Um, in the chat window, firstly, I've put a link to his chosen charity, which is Water Aid. And if, uh, if, uh, if you enjoy these photos and you wanna get his book, I've also pasted a link uh, to the to the uh, Amazon page uh, and the deer is actually based in Edinburgh for those of you in Edinburgh that want a signed copy uh, I'm sure he would be able to sort that out for you he's probably even got a stock of books at home for sale as well so I'll leave you to sort that directly with Nadir if you want that um, so uh, please give generously to the charity if you can we always try and raise money at these talks um, and uh, with that I'll hand over to Nadir Right, well, thank you all very much. Um, pleasure to talk to you. Um, so tonight's uh, talk is going to be about uh, a project called Extreme Scotland. Um, as Ollie said, it's, uh, it's, it's a book project. So uh, what we're going to do tonight is really talk you through the process of that and, and some of the background, some of, some of the images. Uh, so there's going to be some lots of photos and some videos and things. So we'll just kick off with uh, a little sort of introductory video. Um, right. <laughs> So, 
So Extreme Scotland was uh, an idea that I had back in 2012. I used to, I lived down in Essex uh, for many years and I was lying on my sofa um, uh, one, I think it was, that must have been about sort of June time. And I, I was having a nap and I, so I woke up and I just had this idea about a project called Extreme Scotland. Um, and initially I thought maybe it, it could be a calendar or something like that. And the, I was thinking about, I was thinking there's, there isn't like a really good quality adventure sport book focusing on Scotland. There was, there was things like the Red Bull Illumi, uh, which is uh, an adventure sport book based around the whole world. Um, and there's landscape photographer of the year books, um, which are just landscape throughout the whole of Britain. There was nothing focusing on Scotland, they're focusing on adventure sport. And I thought, that sounds like a good idea, but maybe I could do something with this. So I spoke to a few friends who are mountain guides and uh, I, I asked them what, what they thought. And generally, the, um, the views were favourable. And I put this photo up first of all, because this was shot on the first photo shoot of Extreme Scotland. And it kind of sums up what Extreme Scotland was about. It was it's about really capturing the adventure sport in the cool landscape of Scotland. So it was great light. Scotland has amazing light. It's got amazing opportunities for adventure sport and it's got amazing landscape. So this picture, that's why I put this picture up first. It was sure, this is Glencoe. And, um, you know, I was really fortunate to work with some, some great athletes. Now, what I was doing, uh, so I had this idea to do the book. And I thought, I live in England. I'm doing a book about Scotland. How am I going to make this work? So I had, I used to work full time um, in the NHS as a oral surgeon in the maxillary facial department. And I'd given that up. I stopped working in the NHS in 2011. Um, and I just kept sort of two and a half days of working in a sort of independent practice. Uh, but I had essentially a long weekend, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday off every weekend. Um, and I just come back to photography after a long break. I uh, got back to that about 2010-2011. So my idea was I'd, I'd fly up to Scotland, I'd, get, I'd finish work on a Thursday, drive to Stansted Airport, fly up to Glasgow, hire a car, drive up north, stay somewhere in a hostel or something, find people to photograph, drive home on Monday night, or so I'd fly back home uh, Monday night, back to work on Tuesday, and I would do that every month. And I thought that way I should get the kind of images I want. Trouble with Scotland is that the weather just changes all the time. So you have no idea. It could what, Whatever the forecast says on the Monday, by the time you get to the Thursday night, it could be completely different. And this photograph was taken on a day when I was supposed to be climbing on Anach Moor with Kev Shields and there was too much fresh snow, we couldn't climb uh, and I was at Stansted Airport, all my plans had fallen through and I was like, oh crap. Um, so I quickly phoned a friend of mine, um, Fraser Coupland, who runs No Fuss Events up in Fort William and he said, oh the boys will just take the day off school and go snowboarding. And I'm like, oh, okay, fine. Um, so this is up in Glencoe, and um, the, the reason I, I put this image up as well is that this image ended up being uh, chosen to be in Landscape Photographer of the Year um, in 2013. So partly the book that inspired me to do the book, I then ended up in the book. So it was kind of like a, like a, I don't know, something that it's it was something to me it was quite cool um so but it also showed me that you know in scotland you can't have just plan a you have to have plan b plan c plan d you can't just go with one thought in your head i'm going to do this because there's a strong possibility 
it won't happen. And the idea with, with photography and the reason that, that I, I like photography and I like the still image um, is that, you know, a still image can just convey so much emotion and drama in an instant. And the photo has to really tell the story and it has to kind of capture you and it has to be a visceral, physical feeling that you get when you, when you see that photograph. Um, and to me, this photo speaks of some like horrific post-apocalyptic nuclear winter type thing. It's just Cairngorm. <laughs> if, uh, for those of you who know who, who have skied at Cairngorm know that that's how it feels sometimes. Um, and this is just by the car park. Uh, and this is the day that Innes Papert had climbed uh, the Hurting, which is a Scottish grade 11 mixed route, uh, one of Dave McLeod's routes. And I had been up for the Fort William Festival, this was in 2015, and uh, I spoke to Mike Pescott and I said, Mike, I'm coming up for a festival, I'd like to try and get some images for the book. Any ideas? What do you think? Um, and Mike said, well, Innes Papert uh, is up and you know she's going to be doing some stuff so you could team up with her. So, you know, I contacted her and, um, you know, I had, I had one day out with her climbing partner on Crest Route, which was a grade seven. And um, that was interesting. And then the next day, the, uh, I was photographing Innes. So the plan was we we're going to meet at Cairngorm Car Park at six o'clock in the morning. There was, a, there was a, a, a storm forecast to come through about midday. And she was wanting to get up and down and do the route before that storm hit. And me and Ali Rose, we kind of drove to Cairngorm. We left Fort William at whatever, you know, four or something. Got to Cairngorm car park for six. And uh, she was in our camper van. The camper van was just getting blown around all over the place. And we're thinking, holy crap, you know, it's like super windy down here at six o'clock in the morning. So we, and I was thinking, well, wow, this isn't going to happen today. Um, so I kind of mentally had switched off and sort of had switched into going to cafe mode and eating eating chocolate cake mode. So I had sort of mentally switched. So we were sitting in the, in the camper van and um, Ian's uh, Innes's climbing partner um, was like, well, you know, it, it might be sheltered up there. We should probably wander up and have a look. And I was like, okay, that seems optimistic, but yeah, I'm here, you know, let's, let's go. Um, and literally we were just getting blown over. We were sort of going up the vehicle ridge, couldn't see a thing, just getting blown over, just spin drift everywhere. Um, got up to the vehicle buttress. Um, Ali, Ali Rose set up a sort of a static line for me to kind of do my up. And um, yeah, Innes kind of just geared up, started climbing. Um, and I was like, okay, game on. So I just started uh, jumaring up alongside the route. And this, this, was, this was a battle. I mean, it was a battle for Innes. Um, you know, it was, it's tenuous climbing on really small placements. Um, you know, and at times she was almost barn dooring off it. Um, uh, but it was, you know, it was, my breath was freezing on the back of the camera, the, the eyepiece was freezing up, there was just, the thought, everything was just getting covered with spin drift and snow, so it was, it was just a battle keeping the camera clear, battle focusing, and um, yeah, the whole thing was just a battle, and uh, I wasn't convinced that I managed to get anything at all uh, usable, and I was just thinking, oh, this would be so awful if Ennis is the first woman to climb this, and I'm the photographer and I don't get a single decent photo. <laughs> and I was just thinking, geez, that would be rubbish. Um, and, um, you know, she, she, she did the climb. She did it in very good style. Um, we were, went, got, got down, got back to the cafe. And um, she was, and I was looking through the images thinking, you know, is there, are any of them in focus? <laughs> is there a single decent image there? And she was like, what do you think, Nadra? Do you think you got anything? I was like, yeah, I think so. Maybe I got something. Um, and it ended up that, you know, the images were pretty good. And I, well, certainly I was happy enough with them. And a couple of them were on the front page of different climbing magazines. And 
Um, it was all about Innes doing, you know, what, what she was doing and doing it very, very well. I was grateful to be there to record it. Um, so the idea of Extreme Scotland was really to showcase the fact that Scotland is an adventure sport paradise. You, you can pretty much do anything to a world-class level in Scotland. Uh, and this is Inchery Falls, uh, just north of Ballyhoolish. Uh, this is Callum Anderson. Um, um, it was Dave Biggin and, and Callum Anderson uh, who, are, who are photographed quite a lot kayaking. And they hadn't actually run this drop before. Uh, and the plan had been we were going to go up to, to photograph. They were going to run Glen Nevis. And, um, but they said, oh, we've got this other idea in the Would you like to come and photograph Inchery Falls? We've never run it. So there is a thing called Kodak Courage, and it's, it's, it's a tricky one, this, because if athletes know there's a camera, then it can push them towards doing something that perhaps they've not done before. Um, but it can also push them to perhaps taking risks. If there's a camera there, then there's like, well, hang on, this photographer has turned up, you know, we have to... We have to do something for the camera. So it is a fine line. Uh, and often I will say to athletes, look, you know, you have to imagine that I'm not here. You still have to make your own value judgments as to your safety and do not think that you have to do this because I'm here. If it doesn't feel safe, if the snow feels too avalanche um, or the ice doesn't feel right, don't do it. You know, you're not doing it for me. Because uh, the most important thing is that you're safe. Um, so, but they did it, they both did it well. Um, and I used to be a kayak instructor many, many years ago, back in, when I was in my twenties. And they sort of ran it and they said to me, said, do you want to borrow a boat and go and do it? And I was like, no, no, you're all right, mate. Um, I'll give it a miss, thanks very much. Um, but one of the, one of the things about the, the book uh, and having a project is that it actually opened up many doors for me. Um, and many, many doors which were um, almost like sort of boyhood dreams for me. Like when I was growing up, when I was a teenager, I was sort of getting into climbing when I was about 17, 18, and reading sort of loads of books and stuff. And, you know, at that, at that age, you, your imagination just, you're just, just fertile. Um, and I was at university and me and my pals were getting into um, sort of winter mountaineering and um, the CIC hut was this mythical place you know it was like oh man it would be so amazing to go and stay in the CIC hut um, and I, I, I spoke to Glenmore Lodge about the, uh, the book idea and I said look you know if any of your guides are interested in being involved in this etc uh, etc et and Simon um, who was the marketing manager at the time he said, he said, ah, it's a good idea. He said, but tell you what, we're actually thinking about running some photographic courses at the lodge. And would you be interested in being involved? And he said, yeah, why not? Um, he said, well, what we'd want to do is get you along to some of our courses, get you along to photograph one of our courses. We'll see if we like you, you see if you like us, see if our kind of ethos and styles fit. Um, he said, why don't you come along on the Ben Nevis ice climbing course? And I was just like, yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. Um, and you're staying at the CIC hut for five days. You've got a mountain guide uh, that can get you into the positions that you need to be in for the photos. Um, and I was just like, this is a, a dream come true. I couldn't believe it. Um, so we were up there staying at the CIC hut. And this was back in the days where I was just super keen. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not keen, but uh, this was 2013, you know, I, I was ice climbing a lot anyway. And I think I just come back from Konya, uh, where we've been climbing and uh, I was back home for a week and then was up to the, up to the bend for, for five days. Um, and that was great, you know, it was just brilliant because uh, I was just like a pig in shit. Literally all I had to do was, was photograph ice climbing and I was just like, oh, this is great. Um, and um, what I, one of the things that the lodge had said to me before the um, before the shoot they said, "Oh, our 
our partners are the North Face and Ellis Brigham, and we'll be um, sending the images that you take to them, and so that if they like anything, then they they might choose to use it. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Um, and you know, this was one of the images that was shot. This is on Jubilation Climb, I think. Um, and um, after the shoot, you know, a few months after the shoot. Um, I got a message to say, oh, the North Face really like this image and they want to use it on their winter marketing campaign. Um, you know, so this is this is like two years into um, two years into me kind of setting off as a photographer on my photographic journey. And I was just like, wow, the North Face want to use one of my photos as, as their sort of key marketing image this winter. So again, I was just like totally made up with it. Um, and, you know, I say back in the days when I was keen, I was carrying so much kit, uh, it was just ridiculous. I was carrying two full frame camera bodies, one with a wide angle lens and one with a 70 to 200 lens, uh, because, you know, on the Ben and on the Cairngorm, you can't, you can't really change lenses that safely because it's, it can just be super windy. Uh, and it's just spin drift everywhere. And I didn't want to miss a shot, you know, I was just so keen and determined to get every shot that I could. Um, so this is obviously taken with a long lens. Um, but when I looked at the ratio of photos that I took with long lens compared to the photos I took with the wide angle and the weight and all that sort of stuff, it just was not worth that. So that's not how I do it now. But what, but what it did do is it did actually make a really good relationship with Glenmo Lodge. Um, that they did say to me, they said, well, look, you know, we really like the images that you, that you got for us, so we'd like to get you back next year on a, on a sort of commercial shoot. So that then started off a, a good relationship. Um, and this was a, the kind of thing we were shooting, you know, this is the vent in Corian Loch. And, um, and, you know, it was... I was just in my element, really. All I had to do was was photograph uh, climbing and skiing and whatever else was going on. But the thing about that was that the thing about when you're booked to do a commercial shoot, it's not, you don't look out the window and think, ah, conditions aren't really that good today. Ah, we'll go and do something else, you know. Um, you're booked to go and do it. The athletes are, are there. They're, they're booked to do it. So you have to do it. Um, and it's not a matter of, oh, we'll wait for the conditions to be good. You just get on and do it, which means you do go out in some pretty crap conditions. Um, like this day, for example, it was raining. This is the Fecal Ridge. Um, temperatures were above freezing. So it wasn't really a day that you particularly want to be out, but we were out and you just kind of have to get on and make the most of it. And that was, that was all good, you know. So um, all this time, that I was, I was working, uh, so I was working for Glenmo Lodge. Um, you know, it was just a, the image library was just getting built up. And then um, I was in New Zealand in 2016, and I think I was on my way back, and I was, I was at Singapore Airport, and I was just kind of looking at the diary and thinking, there's not much in the way of photographic work coming in. And I was just thinking, that would be quite good if some work came in. And literally, it was possibly within the hour, I got an email from Ellis Brigham. Uh, and Martin Brigham had emailed me. He said, hi, Nader. Um, we've seen some of your images uh, through Glenmore Lodge and really like your style. Uh, um, we're looking for a new photographer, a photographer retiring. Would you like to come on board and, and be part of it? And I was just like, okay, that'll do. <laughs> so it was, um, it, it was, it was just, um, I don't know what you call that, serendipity or happen chance or something or, or prayer maybe. Um, but so that end, that then became a relationship with Elvis Brigham. So I was shooting their winter stuff, and again because. You know, we would set a date like months in advance that this is when we're doing the shoot. So we'd just be out in some really rubbish conditions. Um, 
but it was good because it meant that rather than just waiting for the bluebird days when you just think, oh yeah, let's go out now. You, you capture this, this kind of visceral, elemental thing that is so often Scotland and it's not just bluebird days. Um, and this was on, I think this is the East Ridge of Carnmore Jerrig. It's one of the one of the ridges that leads up to Carnmore Jerrig. Um, and and this actually this is this image isn't in the book um, because this was photographed after the book came out. Um, so I I had a long association with Canon cameras. Uh, so all my cameras uh, and all my kit was was Canon. Um, but I think a combination of getting old, getting lazy, just thinking, Jesus, this kit is heavy. Um, and a lot of adventure sport photographers were using Sony kit. And I'd looked at the Sony kit before and the battery life was rubbish and the weather ceiling was rubbish. And I just thought, no, I can't be bothered with that. You know, I don't want to be fiddling about with batteries and things on the bed. Uh, but then, you know, they brought out the Sony A7 Mark III, and that was a different beast. You know, the battery was bigger, the battery life was better. Uh, it was shooting 11 frames per second, so you could use it for uh, shooting skiing and mountain biking. Um, the autofocus was good. It was lighter. Um, the weather ceiling was okay. Uh, certainly, you know, Canon's weather ceiling was very good, uh, so it was a bit concerned, but you know, this was this was shot on one of my first outings with the Sony, and this is um, this is Robert Thompson on diagonal gully, uh, heading down to Loch Ann. Um, so yeah, you know, I was I, I now kind of use Sony's most of the time. Um, I think the older you get, the smaller and lighter your cameras get. Maybe that's the uh, eventually when I get to seventy, I'll just be walking about with a GoPro or something. Um, but one thing that I was very aware of when, when I started the, the, the sort of the photographic journey was, you know, you start off with all this enthusiasm and it's, you're like, oh yeah, you know, I've got, this is my creative vision. Um, but it's such a saturated market. You know, there are so many good photographers out there doing some great work. Um, and I realized that pretty soon I thought, man, I've got to, I've got to up my game here. I need to do something different. Um, and what the one thing I was very drawn to with photography was uh, the sort of fashion and uh, lifestyle and wedding photographers. Uh, and I used to love looking through things like Vogue magazine and just looking at the images and thinking, how did they light that? How have they set that shot up? And, um, you know, some of the real top end adventure sport photographers were using flash and uh, guys like Tim Kempel, Jimmy Chin. And these guys were all using flash in a really creative way. And uh, I went I went on a couple of workshops with uh, a wedding photographer and um, I said, Brett, you know, this is this is what this is what I want to do. And, and, he's, and he said, Nader, this is what you need. And he's got this big battery pack that was like three kilos. And I was like, well, I'm not bloody carrying that thing up the hills. He said, this is what you need. This is the thing that will make your work stand out. I was like, oh, man, you know, more kit and <laughs> more kit to carry. Um, but he was right. This was this was one of the first shoots I did with that kit. And because it's a powerful flash, you know, like the small, uh, small little flashes. So I had a, I had a few uh, flashes called 580. EX, uh, which were like some flashes that go on to the camera. And you can also put them off the camera as well. But as soon as you start shooting into bright light, they're just not powerful enough. They're not powerful enough to override uh, the sun. And when you're shooting outdoors, you're going to be battling the sun. And, you know, I love shooting into the sun. And this, this shot um, was taken with... Um, with a, a sort of a wireless trigger. So the flash is over here somewhere. Um, and with the flash, it means that you can light up the image so that uh, he's, he's well lit. And the reality is that a lot of the time, the people that are paying you to, to take photos uh, are people that make 
clothing or they make shoes or they make equipment and they want to see their equipment they want to see the logos they want to see the name they want to see all the styling and all that sort of stuff and if all you can give them is a silhouette it's not really what they want so lighting is is really really important um so that kind of became something that was sort of a style for me and i started using flash um uh, a lot i mean <clears throat> it, it's, a, it's a thing that you can only use if you have an assistant. So A, the assistant has to carry it, and B, the assistant has to hold it. Um, because you can't, you can't uh, hold the flash and take the photo. But it does open up lots of creative ways of looking at things. And you know, something like this, when you're shooting into directly into the sun, um, you probably could have got away with it because the snow is a huge reflector. But at the same time, you know, to be able to put the light exactly where you want, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Now, when I, when I started the book, which is 2012, I, I didn't even ski. I didn't start skiing till uh, 2014, I think. And, um, but, I, you know, I had, to, I had to capture and photograph skiing. Um, and I noticed that Ian Innes's mum is on on tonight, Nikki, and I think we have met once, Nikki, in uh, in Morningside. But so I, I've been out with Ian quite a lot photographing. But back then in 2018, you know, I still wasn't a particularly good skier. I'm still not a particularly good skier now. But there's absolutely no way on earth that I could have skied like the gullies on Ben Nevis. Um, but you know, I was wanting to, I had to get those images. So I was, uh, I'd kind of down climb into the gully uh, and get get a composition that I felt I liked. And the reason I put this photo in is that I really like working with strong diagonals um, that from a photographic point of view, you know, people often talk about the rule of thirds, you know, dividing your frame into vertical thirds and horizontal thirds. You want to position your subject and things on one of those intersection lines and you know I, I run quite a lot of workshops and I remember on one of the workshops I think up in the Cairngorms um, one of the one of the, somebody said you know what about the rule of thirds I said it's a lot of nonsense forget about the rule of thirds and they were all like <gasps> the rule of thirds you know this is this is like this is uh, this is sacrosanct this is um part of the, the law of the universe, the rule of thirds. I was like, no, it's not. It's all about balance. Um, an image has to have balance and it's, it's yin and yang. It's light and shade, it's rough and smooth. And quite often I'll, I'll cut an image in half. So this image is cut in half. So on one half, we've got the rock. On the other half, we've got the snow. So it's, it's, I like working with textures and balance. Um, so quite often, sometimes I, you will find that an image will by chance fall on the rule of thirds. But quite often I'll use, there is no, there is no real rule to it. It's just, does the composition work? Does it feel balanced to you? Does it draw the viewer in or does it not? Um, and that, that's what matters to me. So I don't think too much about uh, rules and things. Um, this is Blair Aitken on Anna Khmer. This, this was, this, there was some good snow around on that day, but this bit was not good snow. This was just horrible ice and really horrible to ski. Uh, but the composition was good. And, you know, just these sort of layers that you get in Scotland are just beautiful to, to work with. And, you know, sometimes, you know, the gods smile on you. You do just get this beautiful light to work with. Now, the... One of the one of the criticisms that I had against the book was it was someone said oh it's it's a bit too arty or something like that or the photos are are, are more art than than adventure photography and I'm just like I'm not I'm not really sure I get what the distinction is really um, I mean I, I'm very open to criticism and it's it's the way it's the way we grow is both as as, as individuals and as artists, you know, you have to be open to people critiquing your work. But I couldn't quite get that criticism that it's the, some of the pieces feel too much like works of art. And I thought, 
well, that's, that's quite good, I think. <laughs> um, and this was, this we had been climbing on Anarch Moor and we we sort of topped out and then we were walking back and I, and I saw this, I saw this view and I said to the guys, I said, look, there's a shop over there. Can you get yourselves into that position? So they sort of, they climbed along and got into that position. And the image in color really didn't have any impact at all. Um, it was a bluebird day, it was lovely, it was lovely snow, it was nice and clear, but the, Im the image just looked flat as a pancake. We converted it to black and white and it just totally took on a different feel. And um, to me, it has almost like a, a, a kind of vintage Edward Wimper kind of mountaineering feel uh, to it, you know, with the, the climbers with their, their single walking axes and stuff. Uh, but that's looking over to the sort of Vidian range. But as well as the adventure sport stuff, you know, I was also keen that the book isn't just all adventure sport, adventure sport, adventure sport, because it starts to lose impact. So there's also, um, if you do look at the book or buy the book, you'll find there's also kind of softer images there. There's, there's just like random ice sculptures in a river or a dry stone wall or trees or leaves um, or um, a girl just drinking water at the stream on, in Korean Schnecta. Just things that break up um, the book because I think that, as I said, that in an image, an image has to have balance. And for me, the book also had to have balance. It couldn't all just be all weighted at the kind of hard extreme end of things. It also had to have you know, soft things in it as well. Um, and uh, yeah, this is Blair on uh, Anna Kamora as well. And one, one thing that did sort of make me chuckle a little bit, and this was before I knew about skiing and Scottish skiing was, you know, they, they say the, the Eskimos have got so many names for snow and stuff. Well, I realised that Scots have a lot of names for slush. Um, so it's either transitional snow, or corn snow, or spring snow. And I was like, it's just slush. What are you on about? Um, but actually, it's actually really good to ski. <laughs> so I quite like skiing this stuff now. Um, this is the goat track. Um, this was on one of the um, one of the shoots I was doing for the lodge. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, this is if you showed this to to somebody in the Alps, they would be like, man, that looks absolutely rubbish. Um, but this is, you know, Scottish skiing. This is kind of what we do, you know, it's like we walk for an hour before we put our skis on. Um, so, so yeah. And it's interesting, you know, when I, when I was, um, when I was starting out in photography way back in the sort of early eighties, uh, I was a student at Glasgow University and one of my my, my heroes were Ansel Adams for landscape photography. I just loved his black and white work. And a photographer called um, Galen Roll, uh, an American guy out in uh, California. And uh, he had a book called Mountain Light. Uh, and I, I bought this book uh, and I was a poor student. And I think the book was like 30 quid or something. So it was, that was a lot of money. Then. And I would look at this book and I would just like, pour over it and the images were just amazing and he, there was so much incredible writing in it about the filters he was using and the cameras he was using and I was just like oh man this guy is just incredible um, but one of the images he had taken was of climbers uh, climbers and porters heading up on the Baltoro glacier up to K2 and he had taken this photo from behind icicles of this long line of porters. And I think that as photographers and as, as visual artists, we have, we have kind of little kind of templates. I, I know I have one. <clears throat> and this is um, Tom Livingston and Ushton Hawthorne uh, on a route called Pick and Mix. And, <clears throat> Tom, Tom's, you know, he's a good friend. You know, we did, we did some, uh, some more filming 
in Gogarth after after we did this shoot. And um, you know, on this, I was abseiling off a snowball art uh, down to to sort of get a shot of them climbing up. And again, this is shot with a, a wide angle lens and it's, it's, um, it's using a central composition again and you know, using strong diagonals. So you've got all these lines coming in and you've got sort of lines coming in here. So it's not really a rule of thirds kind of picture. Um, the only thing I would change about it is the color of what Tom's wearing. And I could have gone into Photoshop and changed it, but I just thought, just leave it so it's as it was. Um, but um, <clears throat> colors are colors are quite important um, in the outdoors, <clears throat> and it is important that you have colors that really stand out and pop against the rock. You know, so if if you're rock climbing, you don't want climbers wearing browns and greys and blacks. That that's not going to work. And um, so reds, oranges, lime greens, bright blues, those are colors that work really well. So, you know, my friends <coughs> really get fed up of me sometimes when I'm, when I'm out. And if they really want to piss me off, they just wear black and they're like, yeah, you're not going to photograph us too. I'm like, yeah, fine, whatever. Um, <coughs> so this, this, this kind of shot, which is like a, it's a bum shot, basically, you know, it's looking up as a climber's climbing up. Often it's it's not a great shot, it's not a great view, but if there's just two of you, that's kind of what you get. Um, but this, I quite like the way it works here because we've got, we've got some dramatic stuff going on in the sky. And, uh, you know, Mike's body position is good. And as he was climbing up this route, this is compression cracks on Ben Nevis. Um, and the problem when you're shooting up is that it makes things that are steep look not very steep. Uh, so it's a little bit rubbish from that point of view. But when Mike was up there, um, you know, I said to Mike, I said, Mike, can you put your left foot out onto that left wall? Um, it'll look good for the photos. And can you, yeah, just, just lift that axe up. Um, and can you just time that from when we've got this spin drift coming out? Can you just time it when the sky is clearing a little bit? So, um, they do get a little bit fed up of me. Um, but the body position is important. And if you are taking photos, it's, it's good just to think about body position and get in a more dynamic uh, sort of position, really. So quite often when I'm shooting for brands, you know, I'll be shooting, we'll be climbing as, a, as two pairs so that that way I can get uh, a good, a good angle, so it's not just a, it's not just a bum shot. I can get into uh, a good position to get the to get the the clothing or the helmet or whatever kit it is that the brand is wanting photograph. So this was North Face, so they were wanting this, you know, the 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 pro pro range of kit photographed. And there's within the outdoor retail market, I suppose there's like a, there's a hierarchy of of brands, as it were. So some brands will want, <clears throat> so things like Arcteryx, North Face, uh, Mountain Equipment, Rab, they will want their stuff photographed in, you know, quite extreme situations. They don't just want somebody hill walking or somebody walking their dog. Um, so you have to try and get images which, which show the kit at its sort of extreme end of usage, as it were. And <clears throat> this, this was shot for the Ellis Brigham, in fact. And this was, this was quite a spicy day. Uh, this was shot in 2019. So I had just moved to Edinburgh, sort of full time. Um, and we were supposed to be on the bend that day. We were supposed to be, be somewhere on the bend. <clears throat> and Donald King was, was going to be sort of man helping us with the shoot. Casper McKeever and Sally Hudson were the models and Casper's a mountain guide. And Donald said on in the morning, he said, no, we're not going to go to the bend. He said the wind condition, the wind direction and the snow, uh, it's just going to be, just the avalanche risk is too high. So we'll go to the Buchel, that way we'll be protected from the wind. And um, 
so we were climbing, we were climbing something or other on the hole. I can't remember. It was some sort of grade five mix thing. And Donald was going up at first. It was just like spin drift, just coming down. Absolutely tons of it. And that day we literally just had spin drift pouring down the east face of the buchel all day. Um, and towards the end of the day, light was fading and Donald was like, uh, Casper, I think there's a grade three on this bit of Curve Ridge and uh, you might want to get on it and get some photos of it. So Casper and Sally went around to, to get onto this grade three and Casper was like, it doesn't feel like grade three. Um, no, this doesn't, this doesn't feel right. But anyway, he was, he was climbing up it and it looked, it looked tenuous. Um, and um, I, I think this photo kind of captures the reality of, of that day. And, but I think this photo is technically not a great photo because it's a bit blurry, but it kind of captures what that day felt like. Um, in that it felt pretty, it felt pretty full on really. It was definitely a spicy day. And we were sort of coming down Curve Ridge and we'd, we'd just all crossed um, the kind of first wet slab that you cross when you're going up it. And then an avalanche came down it and we all just kind of looked at each other and we just thought, hmm, that was close. Um, so, and I could hear my phone, my phone was in my rucksack, I could just hear it pinging away all day. Uh, I got, we got back to the van and, <clears throat> um, you know, loads of friends were like, Nara, are you safe? You know, we've heard there's been uh, climbers caught in an avalanche on Ben Nevis. And, you know, that day three people uh, died on the Ben when gully number five avalanche. And they were experienced climbers, uh, visiting climbers that were staying at CIC hut. And um, yeah, you know, it just shows that, you know, things can change very quickly in the mountains and, and life can change very quickly in the mountains. So it was, um, it was definitely a, that was definitely a spicy day. And even Donald, uh, the next day said to us, he said, that was, that was one of the spiciest days I've had in the hills. <coughs> right, I think my voice is gonna hold out for the next five minutes. Um, so, one thing I do like to do with photo shoots is kind of pre-visualize a shoot. So if a client has said, Nara, you know, we want you to go and do this, or this is where you're going to go, <clears throat> I, I'll, I'll take some time to almost imagine what do I want that photo shoot to give me? Um, and it almost like you, you set an intention for the shoot and you, um, you can create in your head images that you are going to create and you work through the technicalities of it and you think, right, how am I going to set that shot up? What shutter speed, what f-stop, what focal length, what do I want to do? You know, what does the light need to be like? And of course, you can't control these things because it's outdoor. But I think that if you already have ideas in your head, <clears throat> then it's, it, it's a, I find that a useful exercise. And, and this image um, was, was something that I pre-visualized. So I knew that, you know, that, that west face of Karl Morgera just looked, you know, kind of, it's all, it's all sort of streaky and it's got all these kind of lines that come down it. And I thought I'd love to get just the bulk of that image, the bulk of that mountain coming through the mist and some climbers kind of walking, walking along this, this kind of rocky escarpment. But and this is just above the CIC hub. And, um, you know, I just got Casper and Sally. I said, okay, walk along there. Just keep walking. Walk, walk that way and then walk that way. And, um, and it was raining and it was, it was just pretty miserable, really. Um, but we got the image that I had kind of visualized. Um, and I've seen this sort of blown up to the size of a wall. In, Ellis Brigham shops, and it, it, I think it looks good. Um, but, you know, the, what I also like is taking that um, kind of fashion style type thing and taking that into the outdoors. So you almost, you take, you, you make the outdoors into your studio. So this is Sally and Mike Pescott is holding a flash up here uh, to my right. 
and that way we can we can get sort of well lit images that look dramatic but are also authentic. They're still mounted images. Um, so you know, I, I I'm glad that I've been able to combine those elements. Uh, so we are coming up to the end. Now, I'm just going to take you to the very last video following the talk. Um, <clears throat> Put your best shoes on, see what it's all about. But you're never gonna lose on Yeah, you make me wanna shout out Just try to win double quick Try to run it to the moon Systematic I'm automatic Cold static Everybody's a fanatic All right, so thank you very much for your attention. And sorry about the coughing fit. <laughs> I think I'm cured now. Nadir, that was absolutely amazing. Br brilliant, brilliant photos and great stories behind so many of those. It's uh, a real honor to listen to those. Thank, thank you very, very much. Um, okay, so um, if, if people want to if people got any comments or questions, please um, pop them in the chat. Um, and uh, I guess I'll, I'll I'll kick off with a question. So um, you've worked with some pretty amazing people. Um, I guess are there any common traits uh, from working with these people, and any anything that you've picked up from from working with them that that you actually use yourself? <laughs> Right. So here's the thing that most of the time when I'm in the mountains and with people that are about half my age and uh, like now I'm out in the mountains with Ian and I'm what, almost three times his age. And yeah, I think that, I mean, people like Ian and Finlay and Blair, um, you know, th these, these people are like top end. These are top end athletes. You can ask them to do anything and nothing is difficult for them. I say, okay, can you do this turn on this slope? Can you do this jump? Yeah, it's not a problem at all. So one of the secrets of good photography is having a good model, especially with ski photography. Um, and, you know, I've been super lucky to you know, uh, work with you and, and um, and, and that's, that's been great. Um, so, is there anything? I, I think that, you know, when it comes to climbing photography, any photography when you're working with an athlete, they have to be relaxed, they have to be confident, and they have to be in control of, of what they're doing. Um, so that if you say, actually, can you just reverse that move or can you do that again? Because I didn't take a lens cap off or something like that. That's not happened, but um, it, none of it's a problem. Uh, so that that's partly, you know, just working with really good athletes helps you to get good imagery. Yeah, yeah, oh, really, really interesting. Um, and just another final one, quick final one for me then. Um, probably quite a bit of hanging around um, to get the right shots. How do you stay warm? Um, layer up. Um, the hands are the hardest thing to be honest with you. Um, and I think I think post COVID, because um, I think I had COVID back in last March or April or something. Um, definitely this winter I've definitely noticed my hands feel hands and feet definitely feel colder than they ever used to. Um, 
So yeah, just wearing, I wear thicker, thicker gloves. Before I used to um, just use like black diamond punisher gloves. So they're not super warm, but they're dexterous enough that you can operate all the little controls and stuff on cameras. Um, but this year I've had to up to um, more of a mitten style thing just with, with one finger free. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, just layering up really. Wow, wow. Well, that's... Okay, well, look, I'll, I'll um, go to some questions from other people. So, Murder McEwen, uh, remarkable photos. How much do you favour black and white photography for dramatic effect? Well, uh, black and white is your get out of jail free card. Um, if you have rubbish light, if you have flat light, um, then if an image if an image looks just looks flat in colour, and it's not because you don't have sunlight, if the image just looks flat and dull, no matter what you're doing to it, then black and white can really rescue that image and, and change it to actually give it some drama. Um, because to me, it's not necessarily about just recreating what's in front of you. To me, it's about an interpretation of what's in front of you. Um, you know, Ansel Adams did it, the Abraham brothers did it. Photography is still an art form and it still, it still allows you to interpret what you see. So I think that black and white is, is very useful to, to kind of rescue an image sometimes that otherwise wouldn't really have any punch. So that black and white one of the three climbers going up the ridge, yeah, that just didn't have any punch in colour. Uh, so black and white is kind of your your rescue edit, as it were. That's, that's a really interesting way of thinking of it. Um, okay, uh, next question, Keith Burns. Uh, stunning stuff. Have you been tempted to achieve the same quality from a drone? Um, Not as such. I've had a drone and I crashed it and I've got another drone. I've not, I've not flown it yet. Um, I think that... I, I don't know. I think that I use the drone for filming. I haven't really used it for still imagery. Um, partly because in the mountains, it's, it's just a fact, you know, it's just windy. And if it's, if it's snowing and things, it's, it's just not... It's not something that you can work with. Um, but so I, I haven't really tried it with the drone is, is a simple answer, but I know some people do and do it very well. Um, yeah. I, I, I think I like, I like, I like, I like kiss, keep it simple, stupid, because, you know, I can, I, I, I can manage one thing, but to try and manage my camera and the drone, mm, I don't know if I've got the, capability to do that really <laughs> oh, yeah, un un understandable um from uh, mark who helps or co-organize these uh, talk series um the worst days could be the best days but do you sometimes wimp out and stay in bed there was a story a couple of years ago was it last year when i really wish i could have stayed in bed i was doing a shoot for montaigne uh, on the Ben shooting uh, a climber called John Gupta. Lovely chap, John, um, good climber, holds a record for climbing all seven summits, um, fastest. And um, we had two days, a two day shoot, and one day in the Cairn Gorms, and that was fine. And we were driving back to Fort William after the shoot in the Cairn Gorms, and I was thinking, I don't feel so well. Uh, I thought I'll take some, take some paracetamol, tomorrow, I'm sure I'll be fine. And um, the next morning I woke up, I think I was meeting the guys at seven o'clock, I woke up at half past five and I could barely move. My body just felt awful. It's just like, you know, when you wake up and you're just aching from head to toe, your throat is sore, just walking to the bathroom just feels like an effort. And uh, I thought, oh no, I've got a bloody go up and do a ice climbing shoot on Ben Nevis. And um, yeah, I just 
just took drugs <laughs> and met up with a guy and said, I'm not feeling so well, so you're going to have to cool me up this thing. And we did we did get some shots um, that Montaigne used and ended up all over the place. But yeah, that was a day I really wish I could have stayed in bed. But yeah. generally speaking, not really. You know, certainly with paid shoots, that's not an option. You know, you have to get on with it. Um, and yeah, on other shoots that if I'm just out with friends and things, you kind of make a plan, you make a plan really, you don't, you can stick to it. Yeah, no. Uh, well, well done for going out when you were so sick. Um, okay, uh, from Gordon Cameron, how many shots are taken to get the poster result? So it depends what sport you're shooting. If you're shooting skiing or running, or mountain biking. Basically, you're shooting 11 frames per second. Um, and you, I'll, I'll fire off a burst because certainly with things like skiing and running it, you have to get the right combination of limb positions. Uh, so you need the arms and the legs to, to look right. Um, so yeah, from a day, from an average day of say ski photography, there could be maybe like 1,300 photos. Wow. And from that, I might pick maybe three or four. But I think, okay, that's the best of that, that uh, position or that crag or that slope or that lighting um, or that jump, you know, so there's um there's a high attrition rate <laughs> you know when i when i started off in photography you know i used to shoot 36 exposure um sort of fuji chrome 50 fuji velvia um and if i got two photos or one photo out of 36 that i felt was good enough to print that was a result for me that was good enough uh, so that was one out of 36 um yeah, now, because it's digital, it's maybe one out of 360, 250. I don't know. Um, certainly, I know if I'm, if I'm shooting for a day, uh, non-commercially, if I'm shooting for a day and I can get two shots, I think that's possibly as good as I can get it, uh, given the lighting and everything given things that I, I, I don't have control over, then that's good enough for me. Uh, so, so yeah, there's a high attrition rate. But with digital, it doesn't matter, you know. Um, you can, yeah, the more you shoot, the better your chances are. But um, if you have an idea of what you're wanting to shoot, then it's a little bit less like just going in, you know, with a, with a scatter, scatter kind of approach to it with a machine gun. It's, you know, you're more focused, but I guess I know the body position I want. I know the limb separation I want. I don't want um, lines crossing the body of the climber or the skier. So um, there are certain things that I'm looking for that, you know, you need to get a lot of shots to be able to pick that one shot. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Okay. Um, I'll just do three more questions. Um, a, so, uh, from Hal White, have you ever worked with or considered working with film? Yes, I've done a lot of film work. Um, that last film I showed you was a film I made for Ted Baker um, a couple of years ago. So yeah, I, I have done a lot of film work. I haven't done much in the last couple of years for various reasons. Um, uh, but I'm just about to start doing film work again. And in fact, um, with Nikki's son, Ian, we're going to be doing some filming soon. Um, so yeah, yeah, I have done a lot of film. And I actually, I really like film work. So it's a, it's a bigger, it's a bigger canvas to work with. Um, and yeah, the, I've got quite a few films on my website. Um, so if anyone's interested, you can go and have a look there. Fantastic. Okay, um, Mary Brown, what's your next project? 
So the next project is Extreme Lakeland, which uh -huh. is, wait for it, <laughs> Extreme Adventure Sport Photography in the Lake District. <laughs> so that, that book is nearing completion. So we're about 80% finished with that. Um, and that comes out this autumn. And the book launch for that will be at the Kendall Mountain Film Festival. So that's the next, that's the next book project. Um, Ian and I are doing uh, sort of little mini ski adventures uh, for Black Diamond. And, and then I've got a few other sort of film projects in the pipeline and stuff. So there's, all, there's always something going on. Uh, there's always some little projects somewhere. So yeah. Um, but the Lake District one is, I'll be glad when that's finished because that's that's taken quite a lot of time and um, yeah that was that was commissioned by Vertebrae on the back of Extreme Scotland Committee but I'll be glad when that's put to bed. Yeah this yeah commuting to the highlands rather than to the lakes. Um, a, another question from Mark which um, I'll summarise into the last sentence. What are your thoughts on phones for, for mountain photography? Just with iPhone yeah, brilliant. now. Brilliant. Yeah, really good. Um, yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, cameras on the, the iPhone 11 Pro is, is really good. Um, I, I've not quite looked into how to shoot in RAW on the, the iPhone, but you can do it. Um, uh, yeah, just brilliant, especially if you can shoot with a wide angle on that. And with the the iPhone 11 Pro, you, you do get like a, a really wide angle. So, And for, for a lot of climbing photography and adventure photography, you, you need a wider angle and standard camera phone. But yeah, they're, they're, they're great. Good, good. Okay, and you, you get a bonus final question. Uh, uh -huh. Richard, Ch Richard Chandler photos seem to root the photos into the now do you think they maybe will become more iconic in 20 years having captured that moment in time so can you repeat the question again please the photos seem to root the photos into the now now in quotes do you think that maybe they will become more iconic in 20 years time having captured that moment in time. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I honestly don't know. I think that, you know, if you look at images, say from 30 or 40 years ago, it's clear that they were, the style of photography, because it was shot on film and because it was, you know, the clothing ages it uh, and, and dates the, the photo and the, the, the fact that it was either shot on slide film uh, or whatever it was. With digital, I, I don't know if digital will age in the same way because it doesn't, it doesn't degrade in the same way that you get that. When you look at old aged photos, you know, there's, you know, the colour sort of fades over time, but that, that doesn't happen with digital. Um, and will the clothing be that different in 20 years time or 30 years time? I, I guess it will. I guess people will look and think, what the hell were they wearing back then? Um, whereas we think, oh, it was cool now. Um, I don't know. I, I've never really thought of that. Um, so I don't know is my answer. Well, hopefully a, an original question. You, you must have been asked all these questions many times before, but hopefully a nice original one to finish. Yeah. Um, so, so look, um, I just want to say a huge thanks, Nadir. That was a really memorable uh, talk in amongst, um, amongst all the different talks we've had. That was that was brilliant and inspiring and incredible photography. Um, just a, a reminder to everybody on the call, um, please, please uh, look at donating to the charity. We always try and use these talks for raising money for good causes um, and we will be uploading the video of this talk 
onto the Winter Talks page with a link to the charity again and with a link to uh, Nadir's book. And if you want to buy a book directly from Nadir, um, then please, please get in touch. She's got a very good website. Um, and Nadir, hopefully I'll, I'll catch up with you in Edinburgh soon and I'd, I'd like to buy a book uh, off you myself so uh, we can arrange yeah. that stage. Let's go for a claim. Yeah, and that'd be good too. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Okay, okay, well, thank you very much. That was very kind of you to ask me a little. No, it's, that was fantastic. Th thanks, everybody, and uh, have, a, have a nice evening. Yeah, thanks Bye. very much. Superb.